Hello, and welcome to the last week of the summer semester. Well, it's not really the last week, because next week you've got the final, but this is the last week of me boring you to death with these videos. So I'm sure you just let out a collective yay, and don't worry, it's okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Civil War, and we're going to talk about the entire Civil War in one day. I'm so sorry to do this to you, but we have to get it done. I'll do it as quickly as I can for you, though. All right, a quick comparison. You may not realize this, and a lot of people don't until it's actually put down on paper. Uh, the North had advantage in every single category. You can see the population, 20.7 million to 9.1 million. Of that 9.1 million people, more than 3.5 million of them were slaves. The North could outproduce the South. The North had more railroad than the South. The U.S. had the Army. Uh, the, the South did have strong military tradition. I mean, if you look everywhere, there's a military school. Um, the northern states, on paper, this isn't even a, a contest. So the big question is, why did the South think they could win? And the biggest reason was the American Revolution. They saw themselves as being like the colonists who defeated Britain. Said if the colonists could beat Britain, we can beat the North. Nobody thought the war was going to last very long. Uh, both sides have some really strong leadership. A lot of them were trained at West Point or saw duty in the Mexican War. Um, when it came time to get volunteers, most states are going to ask for volunteers for 90 days, which is three months or six months. A couple of them, like only two or three, asked for volunteers for an entire year. Nobody thought this was going to last very long. In fact, there's one southern congressman that says, I'll drink the blood of all who have fallen, and there's somebody else who says, the blood of all who will die will fit in a cup. So nobody really thought this was going to be a big deal. The South, their plan was to play defense, but the long border between the northern states and the southern states meant playing defense was impossible, especially with the number of people they had in their army. The North wants to play offense, and they're going to do something called the Anaconda Plan. Uh, this was a plan put forth by a guy named Winfield Scott, who was the leader of the Union Army. Uh, and it was a three-point play. They were going to block all the ports on the Atlantic Ocean. They were going to shut down the Mississippi River so things couldn't flow. And then they were going to stop all imports and exports. Basically, uh, General Winfield Scott, his anaconda plan was going to choke the life out of the Confederacy, much like a snake would choke the life out of its prey. Now, who are the Confederate states? You probably know these already, but here they are in a list. you got South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. And from South Carolina all the way to Texas, all of those states have left the Union before Lincoln is president. Lincoln is inaugurated on March 4th. Virginia leaves on April 17th. Now, the, country, or the state of West Virginia is formed out of Virginia. When Virginia leaves the Union, the western counties vote to rejoin the Union. So that's where West Virginia and Virginia come from. Now, notice Kentucky, Missouri, and Maryland, they were not on that list. And the reason is they were border states, and they weren't sure which way they wanted to go. Maryland was about 50% slave, 50% free. And they were placed under martial law by the U.S. Army. Uh, the Army comes in and takes over, and that prevents any chance for Maryland to secede. Biggest reason for that is, if you look at a map, Washington, D.C. is south of Maryland. And if Maryland had become a slave state or a Confederate state and Virginia was a Confederate state, Washington, D.C., the U.S. capital, would have been surrounded by the Confederacy. <clears throat> Then you have Kentucky. A lot of people think Kentucky was a Confederate state, but that is actually not true. Um, Kentucky was officially neutral. They were trying to figure out which way to go. And in Kentucky, the legislature preferred the southern strategy. The governor preferred the northern strategy. Uh, two separate state militias were formed, and it looked like there was going to be a fight in Kentucky. Um, in the end, though, the Confederate Army is going to invade. That makes the government of Kentucky angry, and Kentucky is going to actually join the North. 
You also have Missouri, which, you know, their problems with slavery go all the way back to the 1820s. And it's almost an, an exact opposite of Kentucky. In Missouri, the legislature favored the North, the governor favored the South. And in Missouri, pro-North and pro-South forces actually do fight each other. So there's this miniature civil war happening in Missouri, and the people in Missouri are so busy fighting each other that the Union Army can come in and take control before they can secede from the Union. So three states, all three had a good chance of becoming Confederate, but circumstances outside their control left them in the Union. Now you have to create an army, and there are a couple different things you have to look at. First of all, uh, why are men going to join the army? The Union Army and the Confederate Army are both going to be primarily volunteers. So why do men join? Well, some people are looking for a cause, whether it's pro-slavery, whether it's pro-states' rights, whether it's pro-preserve the Union, whether it's anti-slavery, pro-abolition. Everybody who joins is going to join for a cause. For others, joining the army and getting involved in the war was a way that they could affirm their manhood. They could prove their manhood. They could, in essence, become men, or so they thought, by joining the fight. And then there are others who, you know, they want a sense of adventure. They had never been away from home. They thought this was their chance to get away and see the country. And they probably got a little more than they bargained for. So once people have decided to join, then you have to do what's called mustering the troops. You have to create these armies. And what would happen is the leaders of the community, they would recruit. They would recruit in church. They would recruit on the street. They would put up recruiting posters. They would advertise. And once enough men in that town or that community have been recruited, they're going to form a company. So you would have like the Bowden Company, you would have the Carrollton Company. You would have the Harrelson County Company. That community is going to form a company and have men go off to war. All right, so we've mustered the troops. We have a new company. Now you have to outfit them. You have to give them supplies. Uh, at first, the states would supply the new soldiers. Communities would also supply the new soldiers. And that meant that there were occasionally some problems with uniforms. Sometimes the uniforms just wouldn't match. They'd be a different color completely, or they'd be a different shade or a different design. Uh, there's some Union troops who showed up wearing gray uniforms. There are some Confederate troops that showed up wearing blue uniforms. So there was not a standard uniform to begin with. It depended on the community that the people were from and what state they were from. So we've mustered the troops. We've outfitted the troops. Then you have to train the troops. So soldiers, they're going to go to state training camps. There's no Union training camp. There's no Confederate training camp. There's a Georgia camp, an Alabama camp, a Wisconsin camp. That means that the training's not all the same. Ohio might train their soldiers differently than New York, and even though they're both in the Union Army, it's not the same training. Alabama is going to train their soldiers differently than Mississippi, so not all the training is the same. That makes it very difficult for these different state armies to work together because they may not have the same commands, they may not have the same ideas, they may not have the same approach. And then it's just hard to adjust to military life. There are many of the soldiers who had never been away from home. They've spent their entire life on the farm or whatever it might be. Uh, there's documentation of grown men crying, asking for their family or wanting to leave. And even some of the officers have never, ever been officers before. The way you became an officer in the Civil War is you were voted by your company. So um, <clears throat> you may have military service. I don't, but I could have been voted as the leader instead of whoever had the military service. All right, so the first battle of the Civil War, July 21st, 1861, the Battle of Manassas or the Battle of Bull Run. Uh, Manassas, Virginia, it's about 30 miles from Washington, D.C. In fact, today it's in the Washington, D.C., Arlington, Virginia 
um, metro area. You have the Union Army led by a guy named Irvin McDowell. He had about 35,000 soldiers. Then you got PGT Beauregard, uh, who's got 32,000. And if you're curious what PGT stands for, it's Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard. That is a very fancy name for a military general. But Beauregard's got about 32,000. So it's overall a very evenly matched um, army. Everybody thought this was going to be the one battle of the entire army, and so people came out from their homes with their families, set up picnic baskets, and watched from a distance because they didn't want to miss it. Uh, they got a lot more than they bargained for, though. Um, it's a very bloody battle. Uh, the Union is winning the battle in the morning, but the Confederates start winning in the afternoon, and the Union troops are going to retreat, and they for lack of better words, turn around and run off the battlefield. The Confederate troops, they're not much better. They're not very organized, and they're unable to pursue the Union troops. They're not able to turn their success into total victory. And there's a good chance that if the Confederates had been better organized, they could have marched on Washington, D.C. And it is true that the war could have been over on the very first battle. But Neither army was able to take advantage of the situation. Uh, there's panic in the north, and the volunteers just come out of the woodwork and start volunteering for the army. Uh, in the south, they think that they've won the war, and they start celebrating, even though it's a little bit too soon to celebrate. Uh, there are even comparisons to M Moses parting the Red Sea in, in church. Now, when we get to naval situation, when we get to the water, it's a little bit different. Uh, November 1861, the Union is able to capture a place called Port Royal in South Carolina. It's kind of near where Paris Island today, that's where the Marine Corps does their training on the East Coast. And it gave the Union Navy a place where they could start to build a blockade of the southern ports. Fort Pulaski down near Savannah that was captured in April of 1862. That's what guarded the entrance to Savannah. If you ever get a chance to go to Savannah, I highly recommend you go to Fort Pulaski. It's very well preserved. Uh, in April of 1862, the Union is going to capture New Orleans. That's the mouth of the Mississippi River. So very, very quickly, less than a year into this war, and the Union is already starting to assert dominance in the water. Uh, very famous naval battle I have to mention. There's the Monitor versus the Merrimack. Uh, that's the first naval battle between two ironclad ships. Uh, these were wooden ships that had iron armor on them. There was a rotating turret. It was very low to the ground, so it was hard to see. It was not your traditional wooden battleship of the day. Uh, this battle was so big that observers from the British Navy were watching this. And when they saw how the Monitor and the Merrimack fought, the, these British naval observers went back to England, had the Queen cancel the order for all their wooden battleships, and they started to build these iron ships and completely changed the world forever. Now, the Monitor versus the Merrimack is going to end in a draw. Neither side really wins, but it's a huge change for the future of naval warfare. Now the blockade is going to begin to work, and it looks like I spelled beginning there wrong in my hurry to get this up for you. Sorry about that. But I should say the blockade begins to work. All right, Tennessee in 1862. This is one of the early focal points of the war. I mentioned that a Confederate army is going to invade Kentucky. Kentucky is going to turn for the north because of that. Um, the hope was that Kentucky would actually turn to the south which had the exact opposite. The other side effect of the Confederate Army invading Kentucky is Tennessee was poorly defended. And General Ulysses S. Grant, first mention of him in this class, is going to use the river system, the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, the Cumberland River, and the Tennessee River to attack a couple forts and be able to take over Nashville. Fort Donelson, which is on the Cumberland River, Fort Henry's on the Tennessee River, both of those are national historic sites today. 
Uh, they are conquered in early February, and Nashville is forced to surrender on February 25th of 1862. Um, Kentucky is abandoned by the Confederate Army because of that. They have to hurry and withdraw and try to get around General Grant's forces so that they weren't cut off from their supplies. The one of the bloodiest battles in American history is the Battle of Shiloh. That happens on March 17th of 1862 near Savannah, Tennessee. That is south of Nashville. It's kind of close to the Mississippi border, if I remember correctly. And there are 23,000 casualties. 12,000 Union soldiers lose their life. 11,000 Confederate soldiers lose their life. That is more than all of the previous wars fought up to that point. That's more than the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican War, anything else combined up to that point. So it was a sad day for American lives. Uh, Virginia as well. Um, we got to talk about that too. Um, there's a place off the coast of Virginia that was known as Fortress Monroe or Fort Monroe. Uh, it was kind of close to where today Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach, Newport News, that area of Virginia. Um, the Union kept control of a fort there, and they started to reinforce it. Um, when it's all said and done, there's 110,000 soldiers and over 300 cannons that are taken to that fort. And George C. McClellan is appointed the leader of the Union Army, and his job is going to be to go from Fort Monroe on the coast of Virginia and fight inland to the city of Richmond. Now standing in his way is a Confederate general, Joseph E. Johnston, and another one named Stonewall Jackson. Johnston is still near Washington, D.C. at Manassas. Stonewall Jackson is in the Appalachian Valley over in western Virginia, kind of uh, the Bristol, Virginia area. And the battle for, uh, for uh, Virginia is really going to go from May 31st, 1862 to June 30th, 1862. In the end, McClellan is forced to retreat back to Fort Monroe. Joseph E. Johnston is injured, and Robert E. Lee becomes the primary general for the Confederate States. By the time this invasion of Virginia is over, there have been 35,000 plus casualties. In many ways, the fall of 1862 is going to be the high point of the Confederacy. And from talking to a lot of scholars and experts on the Civil War, which I will admit I am not, um, most people say that this is the high point of the Confederacy. The fall of 1862 was the best chance for the Confederacy to win the war. Um, Robert E. Lee is going to invade Maryland, and if Robert E. Lee wins in Maryland means France and Britain will probably recognize the Confederacy as a country, and it also means that Maryland would probably join the Confederate States. Uh, General Bragg invades Kentucky again for a second time, and there's this idea that Kentucky would join the Confederacy and it would get the Union forces out of Tennessee. Unfortunately, both General Lee's invasion of Maryland and General Bragg's invasion of Kentucky they're going to end up as failures, and any chance the Confederacy really had to win was gone after 1862. From there, it's just a matter of how long can they hold on. Okay, political developments. We've got to talk about that, too. First of all, a lot of politics has to do with financing. Um, so you have to look at how are both sides going to finance the war. Uh, the Union has this sound economic base. The Union has been a country for, you know, 84 years at that point. There's an established currency, an established economy, an established base. The one big thing that the Union does is they pass something called the Legal Tender Act, which allowed the government to print green paperbacks or greenbacks. You know this better as a dollar bill. A greenback was legal tender immediately, meaning as soon as you picked up that green dollar bill from the bank, you could spend it. The Confederacy, on the other hand, they have to create an economy almost from scratch. Uh, they can't produce as much as the North. They can't even grow as much as the North. They have no diplomatic recognition. 
So one of the very first things the Confederacy does is they pass an income tax in August of 1861 to try to raise money. They're also going to print treasury notes, but there's not a unified currency. Georgia is going to print money, Virginia is going to print money, and this money is not going to be redeemable until two years after the end of the war. So during the war, people in the South, they're trading IOUs. There's no guarantee that money is going to be worth anything. The only way that money would be worth anything is if the South wins. So you're going to give 20 IOU dollars to somebody in exchange for cotton, and that person that you bought the cotton from, they may never get money out of it. Too much paper money is printed, and there's massive inflation. Prices drop. Wages drop. And there are riots in the South because of the inflation. Another part of this uh, this political development is these diplomatic efforts. The Confederacy thinks that if they can gain recognition from European countries, European countries will come and help them and that the Confederacy would win. Now, the one thing the Confederacy had that the Europeans would want is cotton. So the Confederacy, they're going to hold on to their cotton as long as they can and not sell it to Europe because they want the cotton to be the most valuable it could be. They were hoping that places like France and England would beg for southern cotton, but that does not happen. There was so much cotton grown in the 1850s that Europe didn't have any need for American cotton anymore. And when Europe finally did need American cotton, they just went to their own colonies and got it. India and Egypt are two of the places in the world, even today, that grow the best cotton. And England is going to just go to India and say, can we have your cotton? And they're going to go to Egypt and say, can we have your cotton? They didn't need southern cotton anymore. So when that backfires, the Confederacy is then going to say, well, the Union, they're blocking all of our ports. They're keeping us from buying stuff from you. And Europe's going to say, who cares? The Union's buying enough stuff from us anyway. We don't need your money. So in the end, France declines to acknowledge the Confederacy. England says, sorry, we can't help you. And Russia says, since they're not helping you, we're not interested either. So the Confederacy is going to be in it on their own. Another diplomatic development or a political development is the need for new men in the army. Uh, both the Confederacy and the Union, they had this initial wave of volunteers, but after a while, those volunteers kind of slowed down. And the original volunteers, their term of enlistment is up. So both the North and the South are going to pass conscription. It's this forced draft, if you will. Um, neither the North or the South really likes the idea of conscription. They don't want to fight. Um, one significant thing about the North, though, is people could pay to have somebody else take their place. So if you were a person with money and your name or your number was called, you could pay to have a representative go in your place. So in the Union, it was very much seen as a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. There are these peace movements that happen both in the Union and the Confederacy. For the Union, the peace movement is called the Copperhead Movement. And one of the leaders of the Copperhead Movement was this gentleman named Clement Vallandigham, who was a representative from Ohio. And he's going to run for governor of Ohio on an anti-war platform. Uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't like the fact that somebody was trying to run on an anti-war platform. And when it comes down to it, Lincoln is just as much a politician as anybody else was. So Lincoln ordered the army to take over Ohio. And General Ambrose Burnside, and please, please, please look up Ambrose Burnside, look up a picture of him and just bask in the glory of his sideburns. But uh, Ambrose Burnside is named the commander of the Union Army and the military commander of Ohio. Once, uh, once Ambrose Burnside is the commander of the Ohio Territory, he arrests Vlandikam and he is then banished to the Confederacy. The 
Confederacy wants to know why this guy is banished there because he's not one of them, and the Confederacy banishes him to Canada. In the end, Clement Vallandigham is still going to run for the governor of Ohio while he's in Canada. Crazy story. For the Confederacy, there's this peace movement that begins in eastern Tennessee, western North Carolina, northern Georgia, and northern Alabama. Those were parts of the Confederacy that actually voted to stay in the Union, so they never really wanted to become part of the Confederacy anyways. There are even some people, uh, there's a couple, there are soldiers in Tennessee who are raised to fight against the Confederacy. There are soldiers in Georgia who fight against the Confederacy, and there are soldiers in Mississippi who fight actively against the Confederacy. And at the longer the war goes on, the more and more soldiers begin to abandon the Confederate Army. By the time the war is over, there's something like 600,000 soldiers on paper for the Confederacy, but they could only account for about 200,000 of them. It's a lot of people who are abandoning the Confederate cause. Now, women do have to be included. Uh, while women did not have a lot of political power, they did have a lot of political influence. And women in the South, specifically, were expected to show their support for the war while remaining in their established gender roles. You also find this in the North, but it's more visible in the South. Uh, women were expected to sacrifice for their men. Women were expected to give equipment and clothing to their men, spiritual guidance, moral support, and support their families all at the same time. Very often those expectations either were not or could not be met. And women, they would stop supporting the war as the war got more and more bleak. Uh, women would hide prisoners who have escaped. Women would help people from the other side get home. Soldiers were encouraged to desert. Uh, women were angry, and they were letting their anger be shown. Now, probably the biggest piece of politics out of the early Civil War was the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, you've probably heard all through elementary school, middle school, and high school that Abraham Lincoln freed the, state, the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation. And that is just not actually what happened. When the Emancipation Proclamation was published on January 1st, 1863, it was a political document that had no power. And I, I'm sorry to break your hearts and, and um, you know, kill all the lies you've heard, what the Emancipation Proclamation did is it freed the slaves from areas actively in rebellion against the United States, meaning Confederate territory not yet held by the Union Army. That meant that the Emancipation Proclamation was completely unenforceable. So if it didn't actually free the slaves, and if it was completely unenforceable, what did it do? It gained support for the war and encouraged people to continue the war and to reelect Abraham Lincoln. And I've got a picture there of the first page of the Emancipation Proclamation there. Now, the late Civil War, what's going on here? A couple of battles. This is where we get kind of battle intensive, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, there's a battle at the city of Vicksburg, and there's a battle at the city of Gettysburg, and both of them are happening at almost the same time. Gettysburg, you've probably heard of. Vicksburg, maybe not. Now, Vicksburg is located on the Mississippi River. It is in Mississippi, and it was the last river crossing in Confederate control. Now, that was important because Texas and Arkansas was where the horses for the Confederate cavalry came from, and that was one of the few advantages that the Confederates had was the quality of their horsemen. Now, there's a month-long siege. There's a, um, the city of Vicksburg is surrounded and basically starved, and it's forced to surrender on July 4th, 1863. And what that did is it shut down the Mississippi River. The Union had complete control of it from top to bottom, and it cut off the Western Confederacy from the rest of the Confederate states. So Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, and Arizona, and a couple other places, they had to fight their own battles. They couldn't rely on the rest of the Confederacy to come and help them. And there's a very famous 
saying from Abraham Lincoln, he says, the father of all waters now runs unvexed to the sea. Now, Gettysburg is happening at the same time, and Gettysburg is almost an accidental battle. Uh, it goes from July 1st to 3rd, 1863. Robert E. Lee has invaded Pennsylvania because he thinks it's his chance to win. And on day one, there's a Confederate victory. Um, both sides withdraw. The Confederacy has the upper hand. And overnight, Robert E. Lee is asking his generals and his spies to get him intelligence so he knows what's happening, so he can prepare for day two of battle. And somehow the Confederate spies fail to report that the Union Army has had reinforcements. So day two kind of goes to a stalemate, if you will. Now day three is even worse and ends up being a Confederate defeat because once again Robert E. Lee gets incorrect intelligence and one of his generals is late carrying out plans. Now, how close did the Confederacy come to winning the Battle of Vicksburg? Or not Vicksburg, but Gettysburg? Well, at one point, there's a famous point in time where the Confederate Army has broken through the Union lines and hand-to-hand -hand combat is going on, and the Confederates look like they're going to win. But eventually, they're just overwhelmed by the Union having more soldiers and more manpower. The Atlanta campaign, this is a little bit more familiar to us. Uh, William T. Sherman has about 100,000 soldiers. He's going to face off against General Joseph E. Johnston, who has about 60,000 soldiers. And this fight's going to go from Chattanooga to Atlanta following the railroad that connects the two cities. More or less today, this is going to be the path of I-75 or US-41 going between the two cities. So... Almost every city between Chattanooga and Atlanta saw some sort of warfare. East Ridge, Ringgold, uh, Tunnel Hill, Resaca, Dalton, Rocky Face, and finally Kennesaw Mountain. There's going to be battles all along there. Uh, with each battle, Johnston would stop Sherman's army. Sherman's army would go around Johnston, and Johnston would have to retreat to protect the rear side of his uh, forces. By the time Joseph E. Johnston has retreated back to Atlanta, he is, for lack of better words, fired and replaced by a guy named John Bell Hood. Uh, Hood is going to be in charge for eight days, and in eight days he is going to lose 13,000 men, which is more than Johnston had lost in three months. Hood is very quickly fired, and Johnston is rehired and becomes the head of the forces protecting Atlanta again. Now, you've probably heard that Sherman burned Atlanta. Sherman's a bad name here in the Atlanta area, but the truth is the Confederates burned Atlanta. The Confederates burned anything of value in Atlanta before Sherman could take it. When Sherman does take Atlanta, he doesn't put the fires out, but he also doesn't start them. Another very famous thing for Georgia history is Sherman's march to the sea. Um, Sherman had a long history. He was a career military man, and he kind of realized that the only way to defeat the South is to defeat them morally, spiritually, and militarily. So he comes up with this idea to defeat the will of the South to fight. And his plan is to march from Atlanta to Savannah, He's going to live off the land, and he's going to destroy everything that's in sight. He gets the okay to do this, and beginning on November 15th of 1864, he's going to take a 60,000-man army and march a path that's 60 miles wide all the way from Atlanta to Savannah. Now, half of his force is going to move down what would be today I-75, go down to Macon, and then down I-16 to Dublin. The second half of his men is going to move east towards Decatur and then out what would be I-20 today towards Madison, then south to Milledgeville, which was the state capital at the time, and then they're going to meet up in Dublin. During this entire trip, the only real resistance that Sherman's men find was in Milledgeville because Milledgeville was the state capital. 
And in Milledgeville, it's just old men and young children at Georgia Military College who are trying to defend the city, and frankly, they can't. Once the army meets back up in Dublin, they march southwest towards Savannah, and Sherman's army is going to get to Savannah on December 20th, 1864. Uh, from my readings, there's not a shot fired. The Confederates abandon Savannah without harm, and Sherman presents Savannah to President Lincoln as a Christmas gift by telegram. Now, the end of the war, uh, General Lee and General Grant, they're going to battle each other in Virginia. Um, it's kind of like a cat and mouse game. Every time Grant thinks Lee is surrounded, Lee is able to escape. There's also the siege of Petersburg. Uh, Petersburg, um, it's a suburb of Richmond. It's on the south side of the city. It's a suburb of the capital. And this is going to go from June 9th, 1864 to March 25th, 1865. It is important because it's one of the earliest uses of trench warfare, and that's going to become increasingly used and more important as we get towards World War I. It's also known for a battle called the Crater. On July 30th of 1864, somewhere between eight and 10,000 pounds of explosives are set off in a tunnel underground, and hundreds of men die. This big crater opens up in the, the enemy lines, but nobody can take advantage of it. The trenches are rebuilt, and the battle continues. When we get to April of 1865, Robert E. Lee has kind of run out of places to run, and he is surrounded at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, having nowhere to go, Lee is forced to surrender to Grant on April 9th. That's actually not the surrender that ends the war, though. A lot of people don't realize that, because that's the famous surrender. Joseph E. Johnston is going to continue fighting until April 26th, where he surrenders to William T. Sherman in North Carolina. And the very last documented battle of the war happens in Columbus, Georgia, where Union Army and Confederate Army are fighting over the bridge between Columbus and Phoenix City. Now, ultimately, Abraham Lincoln does not live to see the end of the war. Lincoln is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth on April 14, 1865, in Ford's Theater. <coughs> Now, probably no surprise, the word of this video is going to go at the end. I meant to put it earlier, but I just got so caught up in talking about the Civil War that I forgot to give it to you earlier. Uh, the the uh, secret word for today is going to be research, R-E-S-E-A-R-C-H, research. I hope that you are all furiously working on your research paper this week. If you have any questions about your research paper, please don't hesitate to email me, Blackboard message me, or even text me, chat me on Discord so I can answer those questions as quick as I can. So the question, or not question, but the secret word for this video is research. Good luck on your research papers. If you need any help, let me know. All right, that's it for now. I think I've taken enough of your time. I don't even know how long this video is, but um, I'll have another video for you on Wednesday, and that'll be the last video of the semester. So um, we will see you on Wednesday. Have a good first half of your week. Bye-bye.